Okay, cool. So, um, three main components to TPM keys. Creating them, certifying them, and using them. So, when you're creating a TPM key, the first question you need to ask yourself is, what kind of key do I need? In part, because there are two different ways to create keys, one of which is an identity key and one of which is everything else. Um, there's technically three, but if you're not worried about certified migratable keys yet, that's the advanced class. <laughs> Trust me, that's the advanced class. Um, so, <clears throat> a quick review and a little more detail than we covered earlier today. Also feels bad. So, identity keys, also known as AIKs or attestation identity keys, sign data that comes from the TPM, not, not user data, although we'll get into how you can do that anyway tomorrow, um, but signs things like quotes, um, certified key certificates, other reports from the TPM. If you're doing tick counters, you can use an identity to sign it. You can have many identities. Um, this is not one identity permanently. There are also signing keys, which can be used to sign user data. Um, and in fact, a much more format flexibility than, than identity keys do. Um, there are storage keys, which are used for encrypting data. And I will note the data here includes other keys. There are also binding keys, which in a funny technicality are only used to decrypt data. Um, storage keys also decrypt data, of course. But the binding keys are generally used if you've got data coming in from another platform. You can use a binding key to decrypt it whereas storage keys are for encryption and decryption on the local platform. Um, there are also legacy keys, which can be used for signing or encryption, but they are noticeably lower security. They're there for backwards compatibility. These are basically a 1.1 TPM key. They are only usable in some commands. And a, a note here, if you've got your TPM configured in PIPs mode, which is to say meeting some minimal levels of security, even though it isn't technically PIPs approved, um, legacy keys can be created. Um, in general, when we see legacy keys, it's because someone has created a key in software and imported it into, it, into the TPM. So, everything except an identity key and the legacy key that's imported, um, you create using a command called create wrap key. Um, this has lots and lots and lots of choices in it. First, you have to tell it the key type. You have to tell it how many bits the key should have. Um, in most TPMs today, the range you're looking at is 512 bits at the low end, 2048 bits at the high end. Now, a TPM can theoretically support keys of arbitrarily high length, but again, we're hitting that point where the PC client spec said it must at least support 2048 bits. And therefore, that's all anybody supports because why put in anything extra in a $1 chip? Um, you can choose whether or not to give it an authorization value. You can choose whether there should be any constraints on it in terms of what the PCR values need to be and what localities can, can use it. And again, I'm, I'm skimming over locality a lot here because most of the time, we don't see it used implementing it in the net, but if you want to have a key that is only used by a Flickr program, this is one of the ways you do it, is you could say this is only available in locality three. Um, PCR, yes. Yes. That I will get to how those PCR constraints are enforced a little bit later, but in short, whatever you specify here, must be true for the, key, for the key to be used. It can be loaded in any state you like, but it's never going to be used until those constraints are met. And the PCR constraints, I will note, whereas we usually say if it's a quote, we're going to say all 24 PCRs, usually if we're talking about keys, we do not use all 24 because those are the constraints that must be imposed whenever the TPM is used. So any more than you absolutely have to have is one more opportunity for the key to become unusable and you've accidentally denied a service to yourself. Whoops. So for example, if we've got a key that is supposed to be locked to um, that pretty little virtualization 
uh, dynamic root of trust for measurement architecture we had before, we're going to lock it only to those PCRs set by the dynamic root of trust for measurement, and we are not going to depend at all on the PCRs set by the static root of trust for measurement, because after all, those values no longer matter. If we set the key to depend on all 24, suddenly it would require both to have operated correctly, and we're missing a lot of the advantage that we got from saying we're depending on the dynamic group of trust for measurement. Um, this is when you can specify whether a key is migratable or non-migratable. And note, none of these options change after the key is created. You cannot update the PCR constraints on a key any more than you can change whether it's migratable or not. This means that the PCR constrained keys, if you update your machine in such a way that the PCRs change, you're going to have to create a new key. This is part of why having a convenient built-in certification mechanism is so important for the TDM. This is why PCR locked keys yeah. are a thing to use carefully. They are tremendously powerful yeah. and tremendously fragile. In general, we do not like you can set PCR constraints on your storage root key if you're feeling like breaking your TP. Why anyone would do this, I don't know. But theoretically it's possible. Um, in general, PCR constraints do not use them unless you have a specific application with a specific goal in mind and your system is built to accommodate it. So if you want to say this key is only usable by this user, or you know, with these authorization values after event X has happened, you can start you can start doing things like that, but you're risking it if, if your values change, it's, it's dead. 2.0, we're going to start seeing much more flexibility. Um, 2.0, we're going to start seeing PCR constraints that are things like these PCR constraints or some other set of PCR constraints <coughs> approved by public key X. So I can have a central authority that can update the constraints on my key. Okay. Or we can start saying um, you know, PCR 13 is A or B or C. So there's much more ability to not trivially break things in 2.0, but trade-off, lots more complexity. This is a symbol equals or not equals. That you start evaluating booleans. And, um, also, certain keys, like signing keys are the one that really has, has this show up, have options. So signing keys, there's three different signature schemes you can select. We're going to go into a lot more detail about that tomorrow morning. Um, in general, look at the key in question to determine what options it has. Most of them are not especially surprising. That one happens to be. In addition, when you create a key, you have to provide a parent key, which needs to be a storage key already loaded into the TPM. Conveniently, the SRK is a storage key already loaded into the TPM, which is part of why we see it used as a parent for all sorts of things. The first keys you create, it has to be the parent for, because after all, you don't have any others. Um, but you can create, a, if you want to have a password protected series of keys where you have to know the, the password in order to unlock them, you can create another storage key with the password and, and that's where that sort of authorization comes in. Create wrap key outputs a key blob, which contains an encrypted private half and all of this data, um, which the user is responsible for storing <coughs> safely, usually on the disk, although you can load a limited number of keys into your um, part, uh, into your TPM's memory um, and lock them there if you're the owner. Why is it the non-migratable non keys are exportable? That is counterintuitive. Here's the thing. They're not exportable. They just live off of the TPM. Um, I, well, I wasn't covering that until you asked the question. <laughs> the question is why are non-migratable keys exportable? So this key block is effectively, there's nothing private in it that's not encrypted. I can publish a key blob in the New York Times and be completely confident that that's fine because only my TPM can load it again. I mean, not brute force tax, but um, the <coughs> key blobs are protected by a local key. 
So when I say this lives outside the TPM, that's not it can be exported to other TPMs. That's not other people can use it. It's the TPM is small and has limited storage space. So it encrypts things and has the user store them elsewhere. Um, now this means that we can do things like they might be stored on a local disk. I might have applications where there's a database somewhere that has a key blob for each machine. And part of the request is, by the way, please sign this data with this key. That's fine. If you're not the machine in question, you can't use that key blob anyway. There's not actually a security headache there. So we don't really care how these are maintained, but they're maintained outside of the TBM, and then they're protected with the parent. Identity keys are a little bit different. Make identity, unlike create wrap key, must be authorized by the owner. Also, make identity doesn't let you pick a whole bunch of things. It will always be a 2048-bit non-migratable key. Um, uh, you can pick what the parent is. Um, maybe, actually, the parent may always be the SRK now that I think about it. Um, you can choose whether or not it has a key password. You can impose PCR constraints on it. Um, but fundamentally, the, the big choices that you may choose to shoot yourself in a put with in normal keys, i.e. creating it too short, creating it migratable when you didn't mean to, you cannot possibly do with an identity key. Identity keys are inherently just a little bit more secure than other keys, not because you can't create another key that has the same security properties, but because you can't not create an identity that has good security properties. The other thing that is different here is I know here there's a privacy CA to create a signing request for. We're going to talk in the next section about how we certify TPM keys. And identity keys have a special certification mechanism that uses a special protocol with a special kind of CA. I'm sure you're really excited about all of this because we're breaking the standards right and left. Um, there is this command outputs both a key blob and a special format certificate signing request that can be sent to the CA. Um, you do not actually need to keep this signing request. You can generate these signing requests without having the TPM involved. So I'm not concentrating on this very much. But it's worth noting that this is one of the options you have to provide, even if it's a junk key. So the key blob is the exact same format as the create wrap key outfit. So these are all, this is not, not a wrap key. It's just a specialized kind of wrap key that you had to create using a special command to support special permissions. There you go. Um, the certificate signing request is not a self-signed signing request from X509. It's part of this other protocol that we'll get to in a moment. 